So today, I'm going to talk to you guys about some uh, recent experiments uh, we've done in the Williams lab that have really expanded uh, the biochemical role for uh, ferrous iron as a cofactor in biochemistry and sort of what that means for the origin of life. So as many in this uh, room I'm sure are aware, uh, life originated, life evolved on a very different earth than the, the one we know uh, today, we know and love. Uh, in fact, it was uh, totally anoxic for at least about half of earth history uh, with oxygen approaching uh, modern levels only about half a million years ago. And so what that allowed for uh, was the buildup and persistence of a uh, very high amount of ferrous iron, iron 2, uh, relative to, to today. And so life evolved, you know, between 4 and 3 billion years ago, and then preceding that we had major, your major biochemical functions and, and systems. And so my advisor likes to say that, uh, that life, life evolved behind an iron curtain. And so we can think of, you know, sort of what that means for uh, the origin of life and how that affected the origin of life. And so when I, when I talk about sort of the central biochemical systems, uh, this was already brought up by our, our plenary speaker, but so, uh, the central dogma of molecular biology. So the replication of DNA, its transcription into RNA, and then RNA's subsequent uh, translation into protein. And so why, why that would be important for thinking about you know, what the cation content of the environment these were being designed or evolved in is that all of these are totally dependent on, on divalent metal cations. Uh, in the, the two, two first steps, uh, uh, they're required for sort of um, uh, structuring the, the, the nucleic acid in the binding site as well as a catalytic function of uh, facilitating the, the growing nu uh, nascent nu nucleic acid. And then just a whole slew of structural and functional roles in, in, in translation. And so what we think of now, or at least what biochemists and bioorganic chemists think of now mediating these functions is, is all magnesium. It's all magnesium doing this stuff. And so just as an as an example, I'm sure most of you, or some of you in this room, have set up PCR reactions. So this is just a, a, a DNA replication reaction that you just use to amplify a bunch of DNA so you can work with it downstream. And so in that sort of reaction, you know, you have a template DNA, you have primers, nucleotides, your polymerase enzyme, and a buffer. And so, you know, what's really in that buffer besides, you know, NEB or some other company's magic mix of things that make it go so well. Well, one of, one of the major components of that buffer is magnesium. And it, that, again, is because it is, is, is so de these enzymes are so dependent on magnesium. And so you can, say, you can look at in vitro transcription reactions or translation kits and, and, and see the same exact thing. And so again, going back to thinking, well, then why, is in, why would iron be important? Well, we've done a lot of work in the Williams lab to sort of uh, Make, build the case that, that iron is, is possibly interchangeable with magnesium in, in these systems and, and, and can facilitate a lot of the same roles. So here we just have an in silico modeled uh, interaction with either a magnesium or, or an iron in an RNA molecule bound to the phosphate backbone. And you can just see how incredibly conserved uh, the geometry and the bond length is if you take that out that magnesium and put an iron in. We've also shown that iron can mediate the folding of nucleic acids. And so this is just, um, this is the 23S large subunit uh, uh, ribosome RNA. And what we're looking at here is just sort of a heat map of places where structural changes have been induced on this molecule uh, with the addition of either magnesium or iron. And what we can see is that the structural uh, changes that magnesium induces are broadly similar to the structural changes that iron is inducing. So places where it's red and with the magnesium map, it's red in the iron map. Places where it's blue in the magnesium map, it's blue in the iron map. And so, you know, thinking about all this and, and possibly iron, you know, really looks like a substitute. We wanted to go in and then see if, if, if it could be a functional substitute. And so we first looked at the first step of the central dogma, so DNA replication. So this is just a gel of a PCR reaction. Uh, and as we, can, as we can see, as you go through more cycles of DNA replication, that reaction, you get more of your product DNA being produced. And by around cycle 12 to 16, you, you have plenty of, of your product being produced. And you can see it on the gel. When we swapped out the magnesium for iron, we basically got the exact same gel. So that was, that was pretty cool. You know, iron, iron's working in this reaction. So then we went to the next step. 
And we used an in vitro transcription react kit that you would just buy from, from any old uh, 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 supplier. And uh, we basically transcribed a, three, a 300 uh, nucleotide template into RNA that we could then see on the gel here. And we did this over a range of concentrations. And we can see that with the magnesium, transcription works best in, in the low millimolar range here. Then when we swapped out the magnesium for the iron, uh, what was really interesting, we saw that the optimum for iron is about almost an order of magnitude lower. So iron is, is supporting transcription as well as magnesium at an order of magnitude lower. Um, in, in addition to that, on the other side, it's actually inhibitory towards the higher concentrations. And by 6 millimolar, you don't really see any transcript being produced with the iron. So that was really interesting. Uh, we're not totally sure. Uh, why it's inhibitory at the higher concentrations. Um, and so that's something we're working towards looking at uh, right now. So the first two steps look to be good. We can substitute the magnesium for the iron. Then we went to the last step, translation, which is uh, arguably you know, by far the most um, intricate, at least respect to, with respect to what the cations are doing uh, in this process. And so here we just have a, a a plot uh, with our protein production. We just use the activity of the protein produced as a proxy for how much there is. And we also uh, measured this reaction over a range of concentrations. And so when we look at the magnesium, this is really what other people found, a very uh, concentration dependent uh, with a, a maxima and activity around 9 to 10 uh, millimolar. When we swapped out the majority of magnesium for iron, we saw that it's definitely uh, uh, facilitating supporting translation, albeit at a little bit lower rates. So unlike the first two steps that look like it's just it's going just as well. But again, the concentration uh, 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 dependence looks to be the same with the maxima around nine to ten millimolar. So we've really we've basically been able to go through each step of the central dogma and replace the divalent cation from magnesium to iron. So we can sort of think possibly about a new central dogma, at least, with respect to, to the cation. And we can even think about these other reactions that that's people sometimes include in the central dogma, RNA replication, reverse transcription. Uh, and while we haven't tested these yet, sort of posit uh, uh, whether or not iron can facilitate these. And it's, it's likely, probably, given that both of these processes are, are polymerase dependent, like D, DNA replication and, tr and reverse uh, transcription. And so what does this really mean for the iron? The origin of life. Well, thinking back about how you know these biochemical systems were designed, evolved, and then used in cells, you know, all in a fusion environment for you know two, two to three billion years, we can think of you know iron as sort of the OG uh, cofactor uh, for at least either either totally iron or, or in. Uh, together with with some magnesium, and then but then the switch over to totally uh, fully uh, magnesium uh, uh, chemistry, biochemistry is, is, is sort of more of a recent uh, contingency plan, if you will, that life had to come up with uh, once we approached, you know, half a million years ago and all, all the ions started to, to leave. And so that's all I have. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, both my labs, both my advisors, Dr. Jen Glass in AS and Dr. Lauren Williams in chemistry and biochemistry uh, in their respective labs. Uh, uh, funding sources, as well as uh, uh, Corinna Tucky from New England Biolabs, who's very helpful with uh, uh, logistical things. So I'll take any questions. Maybe I missed it. Um, did you happen to do any experiments where you used, say, 50-50 Iron and magnesium, just to like demonstrate that a trans. Yeah, not possible. not in the functional experiments. Uh, we've done uh, some experiments where we looked at association with certain molecules, uh, so like competition, and it looks like the iron uh, is binding stronger, and that has a lot to do with the fact that iron just seems to be a better Lewis acid, and that also goes back to why the iron was looking like it was uh, mediating transcription at lower concentrations. Uh -huh. So we would you expect if you put like a 50-50 in this sort of thing and then looked at uh, what's there, um, that iron would be bound. There would be more iron. Okay. Any questions? All right. Let's thank our speaker one more time.